fruit of Jesse will come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. Please be seated. For we're all probably aware of the rise in recent years of the so-called megachurches, generally non-denominational churches that have a very modern form of worship, tend to have a very large attendance. And even here in the largely secular Bay Area, there are several of these. And there's one where just the optics of it have really struck me. For obvious reasons, I have not been there on Sunday morning. I seem to be occupied by other things at that time. <laughs> but I have been by there at other times, and the place looks pretty fortress-like to me. There's, of course, the church and its surrounding buildings itself, but then there's a large parking lot, and around the parking lot, there's a fence that must be at least eight feet high, granted no barbed wire, but it's still set up in such a way that it would be very difficult to surmount. The gate to the parking lot is locked quite tight on weekdays, and there's a large sign that in huge capital letters says CHURCH, and in somewhat less huge letters below it says KEEP OUT. <laughs> now, before we laugh too hard, let's realize we all do this to some extent. This sanctuary is not open and unlocked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, I have had certain members of this church question why it isn't. It's actually a valid question. But there are reasons for which most of us realize that might be biting off more than we can reasonably chew. But there's something about the optics of a church building, a church compound even, being closed and locked and big signs being up there saying, keep out, that strikes us a certain way and it promotes a certain amount of thought. We heard in today's passage from Romans all about how the root of Jesse, the key of David, Emmanuel, God with us, the one who is to come, will come, and he will come for the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. He will reach out and wrap his arms around the Gentiles. Now, who are these mysterious Gentiles? Here's where we need to look at one of the great forebears of our church. St. Thomas Aquinas gave us some amazing tools for reading scripture. I could go on for hours, and I'm sure you don't want me to, delving into this in granular detail, but I'm just going to give you one surface piece, and that is, he said, scripture has multiple senses in the same place and at the same time. And basically, you can divide it into two, and that is the literal and the allegorical. And within the allegorical, there's other categories. But he says it's very important to read it both ways, neither to the exclusion of the other, because to get its full meaning and the full wisdom that God would have us get out of the text, we need to look at it both ways. So let's look at this both literally and allegorically. Literally, the term Gentiles meant back then what in Jewish circles it actually still means today. And that is people who are not Jewish. People who are outside the ethnicity of the Commonwealth of Israel. And so the idea was that even though he was to rise out of Jewish lineage, this Messiah would wrap his arms around in inclusivity the population that was not Jewish. So in that sense, we could say, well, given that actually most of us sitting here are probably ethnically speaking of Gentile origin, well, gosh, check, that's already been done. But let's look at this allegorically. The Gentiles, allegorically speaking, are simply the people outside the commonwealth, the people outside the building, the people outside the community, who have not yet been included. And the boundaries around that are constantly shifting. They've been shifting for as long as
as human community and human society has existed, and they continue to shift. But the definition is always the same. It's the people who aren't yet here, the people who haven't yet been included. Now, if we read this allegorically, this passage has something a little bit more unsettling to say to us, which is that during this season of Advent, as we expectantly wait for Emmanuel, for God with us, the one for whom we are expectantly waiting is the one in whom those outside are meant to hope. So that means that our life together as a community, as a church, is meant to be to a large extent for those who aren't in here with us. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. And since we are his hands and feet and his spirit, in us, the Gentiles shall hope. Now, I want to acknowledge right here that as soon as I begin going this direction in the sermon, I am quite certain that I have been here long enough that I've had several one-on-one -on -one conversations with many of you, that the reaction's a little bit like, oh my gosh, not again. And I want to honor that. That's okay. Because the fact of the matter is, as I look around this room, I know all of you are dealing with an awful lot. There are people who are taking care of children who are struggling. There's people who are taking care of aging parents. There's people who are aging parents themselves. There's people who are struggling to just get by in an economy with a skyrocketing housing cost, commutes that are two hours each way. The list goes on and I'm, I'm seeing smiles around. I think I almost hit everybody with all that. So I get it. There's a little bit of a sense of, come on, preacher. We're already feeling a little bit at the end of our ropes, and here you are telling us again that the whole point of the church is to look outward and be there for the other folks who are not yet here. So, I want to say it's a yes and. As we put together our plans, and we've already done a great deal of work around this, and as January comes, you're going to begin to see some actual practical rollout of some of the task force and strategic planning that we've been doing this past year. This is a tension that we have to hold together. We have to recognize that we are finite. We are finite individuals, we are a finite community, and a lot of us may be feeling like we're already at the end of our ropes, and we are looking for a church that gives us a sense of stability and constancy and takes care of us. At the same time, we have to recognize that the church is always called to be there for the Gentiles. It is always called to be there for those who have not yet been included, who have not yet heard the good news, who have not yet been fed and sheltered and clothed. It's a both and. And as we're navigating this both hand, we also need to acknowledge the sheer impossibility of it. The fact of the matter is that the church's mission, the church's high vision, the vision of the kingdom of God is one in which all are fed and fully satisfied, both materially and spiritually. Even the folks sitting in this room can't claim that we're there yet, let alone the world in which we are placed. And so, let us lean on the message of Advent, which is it's not about us. We are an indispensable part of the work, but ultimately, it is not us, but God who will accomplish that incredible vision. It is God who comes to us, who came to us, and who will still come to us, who will feed us Fully, who will feed the Gentiles fully, and just says, folks, every day you get up, you pray, you ask for wisdom and guidance, and you do your absolute best, always remembering that it's never going to be enough, but that I am enough. So church, there's no question that we are here for the Gentiles. That is why we host Open Heart Kitchen, that is why we have a wellness center, that is why we have a food pantry, and that's why you're always hearing us talk 
talking about maybe discerning really even more things along those lines. And yet we also recognize the finitude of who we are and the neediness of the people who are meant to be here and gather in community and reach out their arms in love in all the ways that I just described. And ultimately we recognize that God and God alone can give us the strength Thank you. 